When Tansri leaves, the Hellbreaker writes about 20 seconds. Who wants to go in with him to make their pitch? Okay. Just uh, two months better hand on DNA and here. <laughs> Thank you. 
silent, what you are saying. <coughs> Thanks for coming. I think one important lesson you can already learn from, from Tan Sri is punctuality. You just look at the time, it's, it's really now 5.30 and maybe it's because Tan Sri has business with the Japanese also. <laughs> some of you will know, because Tan Sri knows, because my, you know that my wife is Japanese, so you don't you know now. <laughs> my father, you know, and she gets very stressed out every time I go to Japan because I, I'm late. You know, uh, or whatever. And then once my father in law uh, told me, he spoke in Japanese, she translated. He said, You speak Japanese, no. you know, like, but she, when she spoke to me, I understand what she says. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, I haven't said yet. So the interesting thing is, my father in law says, In Japan, if you go for an appointment and if you are late, it shows three things about you. It shows one, that you are unprofessional, second, that you are rude, and third, that you don't respect the person you're going to see. You know, it's like you get stabbed three times, and I say, Oh my God. So that was a very powerful analogy, a simple one he shared with me. So it's incredible that Tanshu has come on time. And really now we're just going to get started without any further ado, right? Uh, I will just take off my jacket because it's getting a bit warm. And also, Tanshu, the funny thing about this uh, is that the aircon gets shut at 5.30, uh -huh. but it kicks in again at 6 o'clock. Uh, they've got a special allocation. <laughs> so Tanshu also has uh, kindly agreed to do a after this, when we're done in one hour, he will just do a bit of networking with you guys and then he'll give a quick 15 minute interview to Malaysia SME Magazine, which has asked for it. So, you know, that'll be good for them. And we will just get started now. I guess what happened and why we invited you is that. Oh yeah, I got to switch on the mic. Okay. Uh, what happened is and why we invited you last, uh, when we had the first event last month, we were asking, I, just, I spontaneously, uh, spontaneously asked the audience whether they would like to see you come and speak and share your experience as an angel investor. And a lot of them said yes. And I would have forgotten about it, but during the budget then, they had that incredible incentive, right? And it's great that Tan Sri acknowledges Vincent, uh, Jonathan, and Cradle, because you know they were the ones who pushed for it. Fantastic. It suddenly brings the angel scenario alive in Malaysia that we can possibly kickstart that, you know, which is the important part of getting this ecosystem complete, right? Because many facets of it, the angel one is, is missing. And, um, it's there, but not as much as we would like, right? So it's great. Then when that happened, I said, "Hey, we got to get Tan Sri here," and graciously enough, he, he uh, has uh, agreed to, and he's sitting here now. So we will get started. Uh, very casual, I told Tan Sri. He's uh, normally not uh, usually hanging out with, with groups of hungry entrepreneurs in this large scale. 
But yeah, I guess Tanji, I can ask just the first question, yeah. which is like, when did you get interested, right, uh, in, in, in the internet? It's already done. Yeah. Uh, is it? Can you hear? No, I think not. Oh, sorry, I pressed the button. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> <so> <laughs> Okay. Uh, hey, those watching from Google Hangout, we're in Singapore. Huh? You know what the infrastructure is like. He's a good Malaysian. <laughs> so, uh, well, I think uh, you all may have read that students uh, have internet phone, you know, so everybody wants to get into the internet business. So was I. And, uh, uh, during that time, uh, I did some. I did a very silly thing. I haven't so much stake in PG. You know. <laughs> <laughs> a silly would be understatement. <laughs> I saw it when it was around six billion valuation. Today it's forty-five billion. So it's not silly. I think it's really stupid. <laughs> so. So then I had some uh, extra cash, a bit of cash in there. So um, quite a few people approached me on investing. So you know, and then I was reading. Uh, well, one of the things that I do is, you know, I read a lot. Uh, I'm trying to make up for not going to, uh, not being able to go to the university. So I read a lot. I read all kinds of stuff. So. So we get, so you see, Pajaya is a very unfocused group. It invests everything from A to Z. So usually my friend asks me, those who know me afterwards, okay, which business are you all not in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a shorter answer, right? They don't ask which business you are in. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so like I said, uh, I read a lot of diversified interests, so we get involved in many things. Not very focused. It's good and bad. Uh, it's good when uh, you are in industry that is in recession during that time, and then you have other businesses that are doing well, so it's okay. So it's like Malaysia, you know, uh, diversified economy, don't rely only on one thing. So we have many things. And uh, so I thought internet would be a good area to invest. And uh, so I get to meet people, and it's always introduced by people who know, uh, know my people. I know my family members, so I hear them out, and I was I put out a lot of money. I think probably invested in twenty over ventures. Actually, I invested two hundred over million, two hundred million. Uh, so the one, a few good ones. Uh, luckily, some uh, two or maybe three or four made it. Uh. One is uh, of course uh, Ganesh. One is the most famous, and then. Uh, there's this kinetic, you know, it's a local registrar that does quite well. Uh, it actually does very well, but it's a bit more low profile. And then there's some of these other software things I invested also low profile. And uh, so maybe about four or five. Of course, the Ganesh one is the one that did uh, very well. And I uh, invested, when I met Ganesh, he was 19 years old. Uh, so. I hear his story and I agreed to donate to a well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> invest, invest, two million. No, yes, sir, you didn't ask for angel investment, you asked for angel donation. <laughs> so I, I invested two million with Ganesh and uh, well, originally they actually asked for four million, but after you go through all the things, you know actually two million will do it. And, uh, when after I agreed, I said okay, agreed, and then I said I write you the check, I write you, wrote the check. Ganesh went back, told his mom, he's quitting university immediately because he just got two million. <laughs> so I thought Ganesh, that's the smartest thing you have done. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there is no university guys here. <laughs> um, maybe I was sour grape not because I couldn't go to university, so I thought everyone should go. <laughs> so. So uh, 
invested two million Ganesh and uh, over the years. But you know the word angel. You know, angel is a messenger of God. Uh, we all know different religions, whether you're Muslim or Christian, angel, you know, you got all angels by many names. Eh? So uh, angel investor is a very, very uh, what shall I say? As a generous term for, for these investors. Because not all investors are angel. <laughs> <laughs> they may start angelic you know, and along the way they may turn out to be <laughs> the angel you want to meet. So I think Ganesh was quite lucky because over the over the years, you know, if two million would have just said we need, that would be nice. But today MOL is worth we're going to take it for listing. I think it's worth about a billion, which is not a valuation. It's over more than a billion ringgit. But over the years, I've invested actually almost uh, 80 to 90 million in MOL. But it's in and out. You know, we put in, we take back. Uh, you know, you know, we private, we lease it. Yeah. You know, for I remember 35 million because all these young fellows say, "Oh, we must lease." So okay, <laughs> we'll lease it 35 million. And then we bought it back for 65. You know, we do all these kind of silly things. I do that all the time. <laughs> So we go evaluate 35 million as every pay and then buy it back from them for 65 million after three years. So those who bought actually they doubled their money, almost doubled their money. Yeah, but then we decided that if we don't privatize it, this there is not really going anywhere. So we privatize it and then our focus. And of course along the years we invest more. Uh, like I said, uh, for example, we bought uh, in, we bought many different, different, invest different, different things. So MOL becomes an angel company itself, uh, not investing different things, but most of the time, of course, Ganesh come and convince me, and uh, we discuss, but of course, uh, not, I mean, he convinced me, I must be convinced, and I think, okay, we'll put a couple of million here, a couple of million there, so we keep doing things. So over the years, uh, up to now, for example, in 09, we bought into Friendster. That was a deal that needs to be done very fast, like, you know, a week or so, come and talk. Uh, this bunch of investors, uh, these angels of uh, Friendster, they've been there so long to sing money. So, uh, need a lot of guts to invest in that because they make, they lost, every, they have a loss of average about 10 to 12 million US, you know, not ringgit a year. So I said, okay, we buy this, now we're going to make it work. Uh, so they have so many members, you know, they're 140 million, big numbers, but active one is. At that time, I was still in about 40. And then, of course, it goes down. Like, as Facebook grow bigger, it goes down. So, probably maybe, and today I understand it's about 4 million active members. But when we bought it, we said 12 million. How did they lose 12 million? Because they have an office in the US, they have an office in Sydney, they have an office in Singapore. So, we said, okay, we went through the numbers and said, okay, first thing we and then they have a big office, which you believe it, in the Philippines. And the most employees in the Philippines. That was the smartest thing they did. So we say we went through the thing and said, okay, we will cut, we will close, we will close US office, we close Sydney, and then we remove a few overpaid people in Singapore. We cut down almost nine millions or ten million. So it's almost, uh, I think this year is uh, going to be, well now this last year we lost a million, I think, and this year we'll probably it's going to make break even. But that wasn't the greatest thing. The greatest thing is about a bunch of patents that we could, you know, do some deal with uh, this big company and then they give us their share. And then in the end we did very well. So we were, we, can be, we are lucky, we are lucky. Uh, That's very honest. Honest of you, with me. <laughs> we were lucky. Uh, but of course, we also knew those things Those things were there. You know? So those things have got some value. But we don't really know how valuable it is. Sometimes, you know, you buy a bunch of things, you know, suddenly you go and look into the cupboard, something that could be more valuable than the things that you are thinking about, you know. So we were lucky. And uh, so that's, and then the, we are doing more things. Uh, for example, uh, because I told Ganesh, you should be, you should make MOL, 
should go into every continent in the world. You go to Latin America, so we're doing that. You should go to Europe. So it's buying a big uh, company, Turkey, which is the biggest in the seriousness. And uh, it's in India, Vietnam, everywhere, and also buying a line. So, so MOL will be a very interesting company. So we thought after we do this, uh, we'll probably take it and this it back in KL, in Busan, Malaysia. You know, so we thought we should uh, support Malaysia more and list it in Malaysia. So that's what we're doing with this. And um, so what I want to say is this, you know, uh, some words of uh, advice. Uh, you see, uh, France was very interesting that there was Philippines, you know, because the wages is so much lower in uh, compared to whether US or Sydney or, or Singapore or even here, you know, the people are paid much lower than even in Malaysia. So sometimes you start business, everybody wants the big pay or the current pay that they're getting and all this. It's very hard to work. So when you start a new business, yes, I mean, I started business, I mean, I come from a poor family. <coughs> you really have to rough it out. So my word of advice is uh, when you start business, you know, you get paid 50000 somewhere you want to start a business. You don't expect 50,000, the company pay you 50,000, then you get a few more followers that the company go fast, very fast. <laughs> you know? So, so cost is very important. And sometimes we, you know, Malaysia also cost is going up. You know, for example, I know the telco sector, my God, everybody's pinching everybody. And they're doubling their salary in giving 50% increase. Soon they'll be crazy. You know, so things like that. And uh, and uh, what else? Uh, so we need to stay competitive. We need to stay competitive. Competitiveness is very important. And one of the thing, one of the sad thing that is uh, affecting us is the standard of English is. What shall I say? It's a terrible, terrible pathetic. Um, you pity those uh, people who don't have the opportunity, like all these guys here in the room. All you guys have opportunity, like this. My, you know, although I studied up to form five, I went to English medium school. And my English is also pretty good. My only regret is I didn't go to a Chinese school, so I don't know Chinese. <laughs> and uh, but you know, we are Chinese, so we can speak and speak Mandarin. They you know, can get by, like, you know, cannot engage in a serious business discussion, you know. Uh, Actually, yeah. just let me, sorry, I will ask you, uh, sorry, if I'm just, uh, we have to share one mic, uh, this mic is not uh, yeah. giving too much feedback. I guess when you talk, you said earlier that you follow, you read a lot, right? So you, is that how you follow developments in technology or, or now, I, I guess in the last three years, because you've got Ganesh there, and he, you know, he will. You can bounce things off you, or he will tell opportunities when he sees them to you. You know, how is that valid? Because I did remember you once. You told me earlier on you read a lot, and I'm surprised. So, what kind of technology do you think you do with if any? No, I read widely, and sometimes if I read something interesting, very often I tell Ganesh, you know, you should go and look at this. For example, there's this young man in uh, Bangal Bangalore that is doing this stuff. You know, you go and have a look. You know whether we can, you know, go and buy, uh, Put some money with him and stuff like this. So when I read, I you know I will probably send him a short SMS. Look at this, look at that. And sometimes he send me stuff. Then we you know we read, we talk, and then uh, we see whether we should put in some money. So and that's how uh, MOL keeps growing like to different different countries. Of course, I actually uh, actually push him and say, "Can I you can make this bigger?" You know, uh, one billion ringgit is, you know, in the context of the elite, what is going on overseas, uh, we are like a real minnow, like, all whales out there, <laughs> whales in China, whales in what, I'm sure you all hear the story of Tencent, you know, this, uh, I think it was uh, American uh, uh, fund, bought 50% of Tencent for 3 million, when uh, the, Ma, what thing was going up or starting it? He paid three million US for fifty percent. 
American fund. So this South African company offered them uh, 30 million. You pay 3 million. After 3 years, somebody can offer you 30 million. It's fantastic. You want, you want out. The guy who paid 30 million today is worth, my God, maybe 20 billion US. Somebody's worth 50, 60 billion US. US, I'm going to ring it. So these are the kind of opportunity. So I always say, that I always lament, I always say, oh, how come I'm not in China? How come I'm not in Silicon Valley? I could have given, uh, I could have all these young guys, even the Google guys, I could have given them the gun there. <laughs> yeah. But somehow, uh, what to do? My parents are here. I was born in the US. <laughs> I was born in China, near my wife, you know. <laughs> then we got his partner. No, but I think there are a lot of other Malaysian, uh, uh, you know, successful entrepreneurs like you, and really they would probably prefer to invest in, in brick and mortar companies or, or stuff like that, you know. But you have, have shown, of course, you've got to diversify, but you've got a strong interest in the technology portfolio also. And I'm wondering where that spark came from. Is it just really from your reading, or you got into a, into a telco space, right? And then suddenly made a lot of money from there and said, hey, this telco is technology also. This space is interesting. Did it just happen by, in a way, like by uh, circumstance, you know, and not strategic? No, it is also, like I say, you know, I'm a very unfocused person. So I'm very diversified. I'm looking at all kinds of stuff, looking at new things. So sometimes I have a very wild ideas. I think my management is saying, no, no, no. Please don't do that. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I read a lot. And uh, that's why I thought, and then, of course, uh, you know, those days you read. You read all the valuation of this internet company in the US, and we wonder why we are not in it. So that's how uh, this wandering and whatnot. But overall, I say my experience has been excellent because I always say I'm lucky on the law average. You know, law average. You know, I always tell this guy, hey, you know, no matter how ugly you are, you ask 10 girls to go out for a day. I bet you one will go out with you. <laughs> it can be the ugliest guy, doesn't matter. If you stop swimming to her, ten girls, one will go out with you. Really, a ladies, yeah? <laughs> sure, sure, for sure. Very recently, I was talking to my football coach you know, in Cardiff because I was telling him, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in football. My people always tell me, don't tell you, don't teach you how to run a thing, but I think I have a strong opinion that. You must tell the players uh, to make a lot of goal attempts. So, so I said, what is good? So he said, oh, so what do you mean? I said, I want them to shoot the ball straight into the net. So pass here, pass there, and always. I said, you pass here, pass there, and uh, after the award, the opponent gets the ball and never go near the ball. <laughs> I say, you just shoot it in. Uh. I said more bullet and yeah. so he said, Yeah, but you know, in we have to do this or that. Um, I said, never mind, you know, I'm thinking about law aggression. So I told him the coach is tall, very handsome. So I said for example, you know, I told him about this. You will ask ten girls out of the day, how ugly you are, one will go out. Or then he said, Oh, if I ask all ten will go out. <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, I said, Mount Kim Yan, you know, right? All your answer. I'm sure they all go out with you. But I think if you buy a toy, but if you keep 10 goals, 10 won't go in, but one will go in. So I said, I want that one to go in. You know? So if you have 20 goals at 10 in the game, well, we have a good chance of getting at least two. You know? okay, so it needs to be aggressive. Like, come, I got a question for you. I guess one of the questions people wanted to ask Tan Sri was that when you make investments in startups, do you always want a clear majority? Because I've heard that of you, and, and what we seem to learn from the Silicon Valley is that you cannot take a majority when you are investing in a startup because then the entrepreneur loses their hunger. So you, you know, right? We don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not always. We can, uh, you know, I've invested in a China company, you know, this China thing. Uh, we started with 30%. We are now still about 30 over percent. And uh, same thing, like we start with 3 million and then, you know, so now it's about 17, 18 million US. So not, not, not all the time. Um, 
we want the majority. But of course, majority will be nice, and uh, and I think I'm a good investor. Or like I said, and sometimes angel turns to be non angelic yeah. <laughs> But uh, I think over, I'm always try to be an angel over time so that when I put in two million, you can get it. I put in two million eventually. All in actually it cost me 90 million, but not only 90 million, in between, like for example, we buy 38 million, uh, we paid the uh, transfer 38 million, it's 100 over million ringgit, it's 100 over million ringgit, so how do they finance it? So I put in maybe 18 million and then I we'll ask the bank to lend me 20 million. Now there's a bank lending to you, it's just done by side personal guarantee, number one. Number two, must also give security, you know, Malaysian bank, Kiasu <laughs> <laughs> one. Uh. <laughs> Although I do business with a lot of banks, but they all Kiasu. Uh, That's why you go to bank, borrow money, very suicide. You need to, you know, you know, you ask your father to mortgage his bungalow, you know, and not let the bank give you some money. But you just go in, I got a great idea, I can bet you no bank gives you money. If he gives you money, it's not a bank. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, this guy will give you money. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good question. I guess before I move on to Jonathan, just one question when you said, uh, you know, uh, when entrepreneurs come to you and if you, want, if you want to invest in an entrepreneur, what is it that you look for in an entrepreneur before you decide, yes, I can bet on them? Because we seem to be told that at the end of the day, an angel makes uh, a, a investment because they think this entrepreneur has it, you know, has what it takes to succeed. What do you look for in that entrepreneur? Well, <clears throat> you know, like I said earlier, of course we want commitment. We want to make sure that the guy is not collecting too much salaries that he, you know, okay. he's starting it so that he gets himself paid. Trade himself, you know, some people do that. Some investing, some investment we see, or they start, they say, oh, my old job, I get paid 100,000, so I'm not going to pay 100,000. <laughs> you know, so if like this, uh, if you look at this kind of thing, then you say, oh, this, this guy is not as committed as he should be. Just take a pay card, we're willing to wrap it out and build the business. That's how business can be built. If you build a business on luxury, I still want a driver, I want you know, a big car, you know, all the luxury. So these are important factors. But at least you know that you know you're not going to pay a lot, invest a lot, and half of it every month goes to their all their salaries and you know. So this is one of the consideration. But having said all that, finally we have to bet on the law of average. <laughs> because some may tell you, show you impressive plan. Plans are always impressive. You know, who gives you a plan is not impressive. You don't go to someone that plan is not impressive. You want to promise the sky. You go right and say, oh, my problem is I need to invest this. I think in five years, like this can be worth 100 million. You know? Of course, everybody tells you how fantastic it is. And then you have to make a call. And, uh, and of course, if we are confident, if it's just, you know, we are the only one that he wants to invest in, him, naturally we want a majority like, so that we can, so that uh, they will listen to the angel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've had issues where the, the entrepreneur doesn't listen to your, your angelic advice. La. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Sure, I mean, you know, some of these uh, startups, all these people, they come from all this, uh, you know, so they're all very smart. So not the time they listen to advice because maybe, maybe they say I don't understand the space. You know, maybe you know, I'm 60 years old. You know, this space is for 30 to 40 and whatnot, or 20 plus. You know, but uh, believe me, uh, I may not what, but I read a lot and I understand the space. Uh, but it's, uh, it's sometimes of course we don't make the right call. You know. Okay. I guess let me now move over the mic to, to Jonathan and, and have him share with us, you know, what are some of the insights, you know, and, and some clarity like, on this uh, government, you know, ruling that our uh, it's not really a ruling, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a piece of legislation, I guess, right, that will encourage angel investors to come in. So I'll uh, pass him the mic and then we'll move back. Uh, we've got another 35 minutes plus, uh, we want to end this in an hour. And then we can uh, trust you as a group to mingle with you guys, uh, and you know you can uh, do your thing and then impress him. And then he's gonna have just a short interview with a certain magazine, like I said. So I'm gonna turn. I'm just passing back from behind. Yeah. What is the 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 what is
No, and I, I just realized it's one thing is true. They say when you gain a Tan Sri or Dato Shri, you lose your name. Because nobody calls you by your name. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, thanks. Very insightful information, Tan Sri. Um, if you don't mind, I can call you Winston. Sure, yeah. please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you call me that overseas all the time. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, well, a little bit about the tax incentives, so you know the budget uh, that was announced by the PM recently uh, announced that there was going to be a tax incentives for individual investors. Uh, now, the nitty gritty details are not being finalized yet. It will be finalized by the Ministry of Finance and the Mali Hasil Laminaguri. Uh, so, whatever I say today doesn't really matter. So, it will change anyway. But we do hope, we do hope uh, to see some positive outcome from it. Uh, we've been lobbying for the tax incentive, as in traders been lobbying for a little over two and a half years now. So, uh, so we were very pleased. And when we lobbied for it, we were actually after not necessarily high net worth individuals like country, but actually more of the masses, people who are more high income individuals who have some residual income, they would like to invest or diversify their investment from the more traditional like uh, property or even the listed stocks uh, in Bursa into more private equity. Uh, it's very high risk, we understand that, and that's why we push for the tax incentives. So we are gunning for people with high income. What's the definition? I mean, it's like 100,000, you know, uh, gross income a year and qualified. So we, we're looking at somewhere in the range of about 180,000 uh, per annum. Uh, 15,000 a month salary. Like it's about 15,000. So uh, the minimum investment we are hoping for is about 5,000. Per individual and can go up to about half a million. So these are things that are, are on our wish list. Whether it's approved or not, it depends highly on the powers that you have. I guess what how you get asked is if you invest in a startup and if it fails after three years, mm -hmm. then you put in half a million. Mm -hmm. So can you then uh, claim back the full half a million against your personal income tax then? Uh, and then over a yes, so it, years? It's one one for one investment. So if you invest a ringgit. Doesn't matter how much you invest, but up to a maximum of half a million. So that's that's what you can claim back. And it over a few years, you, like, you can claim yeah. over a few years. Well, that that, that, uh, that that is has to be finalized by MOI. Uh, but there is a two-year reopening period uh, because uh, on our side they are also concerned with fraud. Oh. So the investors need to hold the share and add value to the company for a period of two years before then before they claim back. Okay, but you can only claim back, I guess, if the uh, investment has failed, right? It's not if you made money or right? No, if the company is successful, you can still claim back. Still back. Wow. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what we're hoping for because, we, I mean, uh, like what Tanju said, it's law of average. So we want more people to invest in more companies, and therefore creating more successes. Yeah, but and you're now giving more competition to a, a <laughs> hardcore angel like Tanju. <laughs> I'm sure Tanshree is always looking for you know qualified investors to partner up with who can add value in the company. We don't we're not just looking for people with money, we're looking for people who have the financial ability and also the value add into the company. So just having uh, hundred and eighty thousand per annum is insufficient. We need to be able to add value to company. Uh, opening up your network if you have Tanshree's network, it'll be great. Yeah. Or even adding value like Tanshree gives advice to the company. Those are the type of angels we are actually after. People who are professional and have this high income that can add value and invest in the company. Okay. I guess I'm going to open it up to the crowd also if there are any questions, right? So I've got a couple more questions, but please put up your hand and, and maybe this high tech high tech mic will work out there away from the other mic, right? So if anyone has a question, you know, just grab the mic and okay, the, the button is underneath there. Sorry, on this pass it. At the bottom, just try and you push your question. Just identify yourself and then uh, obviously, got a couple more questions for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Farhan from Rishabashi. Okay. Uh, I was wondering what you were thinking about these new uh, crowdsourcing investments like Kickstarter and all that. Do they, is it part of your plans now? So, say it again. Uh, the crowdsourcing like Kickstarter with um, micro investments. There's many people that put in an investment because they like a company. So every, like you said, it's, it's a form of angel investing, but you put in very little money. Everyone gets a piece of their company and shares are not percentage. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we can look at it. Uh, talk to Ganesh. Uh, talk to Kenneth. You all know Kenneth Chang, uh, Kinetics. Uh, 
talk to my people, they can bring it to me. I can send me an email and you know, I will look and then I will ask my guys to talk to you that, right? Sure, we look at all kinds of stuff. We are willing to put some money here, some money there. Like I say like, you know, diversify. And then we hope we have as we have more experience than our they say our acting average goes up. Hopefully our our goal attempts score more goal. <laughs> okay, yeah. I guess that's it. I'm gonna ask you a question after I go to Jonathan, but the question I'm asking you just think of of the of the craziest pitch that an entrepreneur has given to you, you know, that in the end then you decided not to, but which was actually crazy. What do you think of that? Uh, Jonathan, in terms of the angel scenario in this country, I guess we all tend to think that there are not enough angels. And really actually even when I was in Singapore, entrepreneurs there say the same thing, you know, it's ironic. And, and just like we complain about education system here, you, you find even uh, people in the West complain about their own education system. So this is one of those things that there's never enough. So what, what is your perspective of, of at least within the region, right? Because then of course, like if Dr. Sifa is here, he'll tell you about that Singapore company, Crystal Horse, that has made seven investments in Malaysian tech companies, right? Yeah. So you hear that and you say, hey, you know, that it's, it's stronger there. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Crystal Horse is here. Kelvin, can you just stand up? <laughs> so go to him for money. Well, Kelvin is also part of Richard's Investment Circle, which is a small little angel club that, that we, are, we are both part of. Um, there's a small number of uh, angel members in that club. So obviously being a small club, the amount of deals that they can see and bet to and invest is somewhat limited. But VIC, according to Bob, in the last uh, year or since the kick started in 20 years, have made more than 10 million worth of investment uh, in various different types of startups. Um, so the investors are there. And then you have groups like Become Angel uh, Chapter, you have uh, uh, AIPO, uh, Business Angel Club. Um, those are various clubs they are currently in, in Plank Valley as well, also some parts of Malaysia. And, and then those of you who disagree with Jonathan, please challenge him. Huh? Just because he's got the mic doesn't mean yeah. he cannot be challenged. <laughs> so there, there are angel investors around. And then, of course, there are individuals like country who are, are always looking for the next big thing that he can put his money in. It's whether you can get to these guys and you can convince them that you are worth the money. You know, So you can't just go and wait for the, the money to fall on your lap. It doesn't happen. Um, so I always encourage entrepreneurs to go out, network, you know, you know, talk to people who can then introduce. You may not know Tan Sri, but eventually, law of average way, or six degrees of separation, somebody will know somebody will know somebody who can then eventually oh, yeah. introduce you to Tan Sri. No, you will send me an email. That will read it. Read it. What's the right? Okay, that's it. Okay, TSVT at vagina.com.my. Oh, what is that? The old one is very nice. I just, just send an email and then look at it. And, you know, I read all my emails. So, of course, not just, uh, there's a lot of cut email, but scan, uh, what do you call that? We don't read. Yeah. But people will send in and they talk about it. So, also, we'll look at it. Uh, I think someone sent me one is here today. He says, here, I'd like to meet me. Oh, you know, we can meet. So, just send me, send an email, you know, and look at it, I pass to one of my guys to say, follow up, find out more, you know, we can never know what happened. But actually, I want to end. Actually, in Malaysia, there are a lot of uh, injured investors. I think many people invest, except that, you know, it's low profile, there are a lot of people don't get to know. Like, uh, for example, you know, Dr. Vincent Lee of Star, he invested in this uh, soft space, which then, uh, uh, now MOL has joined venture with them, you know. So there is, there are a lot, except that maybe some are still out there, not ready or low profile, or they will be very profitable and not many people know. So, so if you say investors, I think uh, angel investors, plenty, it's just that anyone with money just going to approach them, you know. Most people, you know, especially those who continue want to do more business stuff. Some of money, they want to play golf every day, so maybe I don't know that one, they may not be so keen. <laughs> so there are still a lot of people who will, who will want to invest, so just have to make make a call. Make a call. Uh, yeah. okay. I guess just DNA's own personal experience, when, when we wanted to launch, we went to an angel, and I asked a guy for 800,000 ringgit, yeah? and instinctively his reaction was, that uh, 
for that amount of money, I can invest in a high-end property, and I can go to sleep three years later, and this is almost his words. So for once, as a journalist, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> so say I can wake, you know, after three years, I can wake up, and I know I would have made money on that investment. Whereas if I give you the money, I'll be worried every day whether you're making the right decision to this and I thought, wow, this thing you hear about people comparing an investment in an entrepreneur with investing in property, right? It's really true, man. It's not some, you know, high thing. So I was amazed. Yeah, no. At the end of the day, investment in properties are low-hanging goods, right? So in a developing country like Malaysia, those are still prevalent. Um, so uh, what I will always tell uh, high net worth people that I meet is, uh, as a good or smart investor, you want to participate in your portfolio. Uh, and again, it's, if they if that guy was just to invest in yours, of course he wants it every day. Again, back to the law, he needs to split his investment into several, several different uh, companies and different industries, different stages, where he knows that one of it will then return uh, his investment. So, I mean, the, the risk and reward are there. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we have some special failures, but for those that succeed like M now, it's, it's very rewarding, not just financially, but you learn as well as you're, you're growing with the company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, do you have an anecdote of an entrepreneur, the craziest business plan or proposal you you know you receive and you said no? I think there's so many, I can't remember. There's so many because I really get a lot of, uh, yeah, there are many and I can't remember uh, which is the craziest. When you don't do it, it's somewhat quite crazy, yeah. I get, okay, uh, a question is if your your fellow, your friends, right, that's a question I had, they ask you whether they want to be, an, if they want to be an angel investor, what would your advice be to them? No, I think I would advise them that, you know, if you have surplus money, you're really invested, you're a wealthy person, you should invest because you help to start, you know, create employment in the country. You give our young people, you know, a chance. Maybe one day we will have, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg here. You know, we have the, you know, the Google founders, you know. So those who are wealthy should and give the young people a chance. Uh, after all, uh, when, I was, when I started out, so there are people who helped me along the way. And that's why I, I, you know, I make it. And of course, uh, you have to put in a lot of effort. And I say you have to be lucky too. And then there are people who give you a give you a helping hand along the way. So, so you, so I would advise uh, my wealthy friends to they should look and invest. And uh, and you can never know you can hit something really big. And like I say, you know, I put in two hundred million. So it looks like I lose most of it. But then two or three that survives uh, more than pay for what I've invested over the years. Maybe anyway, I put 200 million and uh, maybe another 80, 90 million, so maybe 280. But today what I have invested in this space, just the internet, I don't, don't talk about the telco. So telco is different than that is. So it's probably worth about maybe you know 1.3, 1.4 billion valuation value. So it's done very well. I mean, it's over the years, it's paid very well over 12, 13 years, 12 years, you know. But I did, uh, I did very well in the in the telco business. But it's different. Uh, there was big capital. You can put a big capital. You can take a lot of risks, you know. Yeah. I guess if uh, one question I have is, if somebody comes to you and they have failed before as an entrepreneur before, and they're giving you a proposal or you know, and uh, would you? Consider investing in somebody who you know has failed before. What what would you say though? Because obviously you know in the Silicon Valley they probably say the more times you have failed, you fail on other people's money, and you pick up all that learning and that experience, right? And you're better prepared then to run your next venture. What is your fault or your fail? And we we are led to believe that you know people will more be be more willing to invest in you because you obviously still have the passion. You're out there. Well, I think uh, it looks at this little group. Well, what I do, I look at his latest proposal, and then find out what what he has failed and why he failed. Now. And probably if his latest proposal is interesting, doesn't matter that he has failed. I think there's nothing wrong with failure. I mean, if you don't want to, if you, if you want to, if you are afraid to fail, you will not try. You will not go out and do it. You will not quit your job and you know. And I always remember this when I was starting out. I read this uh, book. 
I read this uh, saying by, uh, I think it was uh, President Roosevelt. I think it was him. He said this. And this quote stuck in my mind. And, <coughs> and uh, I remember it so well, I can quote it well to you all now, verbatim almost. <coughs> this, this is what he said. He said, far better it is to dare mighty things. <coughs> To win glory, uh, to win glorious triumph, then to take rank with those poor spirit who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, and who does not know the difference between victory and defeat, victory and defeat, and between uh, uh, success and failure. So basically, this 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 quote is to tell you, go for it. Don't be afraid that you will fail, because uh, at least you will also taste failure and understand failure, and it will make you a better person, more resilient after that. So failure isn't, uh, you know, you fail once doesn't mean uh, it's the end of the world. Now some people have gone bankrupt. Well, bankrupt business, okay, I mean, <laughs> no bankrupt spending credit card. <laughs> going to nightclubs, having bills, go back up that one time. <laughs> so you know, bankrupt in business is okay. They go and bankrupt. The business don't do well. They go bust. They're given a chance again. They will come back. So like I said, I always remember this uh, this saying. And uh, so remember what I said about this saying. Yeah. I think that generally was very inspiring for me. It's great. But then to play the devil's advocate, when you're a successful entrepreneur with, with the same saying, right? Wouldn't you? But you have hundreds, thousands of people working for you who they're not there, right? They they're not right. They're comfortable in there. So do you then internally challenge your people to say, hey, I will find you to come up with something interesting or crazy to go and do? Because you hear that of the of the big tech companies, right? They try to build entrepreneurs from within. Have you ever done that within the group itself? Yeah, of course. Uh to what I said just now is when you have made it, when you have made it, uh, of course, uh, we want to uh, hash our, our risk better. Uh, we don't want to put everything in the basket and risk it all. Uh. But uh, having said that, uh, you know, I was very, uh, very impressed. In the last two days, I read about uh, SoftBank going to buy, uh, buy Sprint in the US. Yeah, but the share price is getting killed. Twenty billion US dollars. But just remember this. This is Maya Yoshi's son. Uh, I think I met him once. Just remember this. In two o six or two o five, around two o five, maybe two o six, six years ago, he bought Vodafone once to exit Japan. He bought he bought Vodafone for fifteen billion US. The whole investment community in Japan says it's crazy, it's going to fail. He did so well, and uh, he's very big. He became the second richest man in Japan, you know, ranking by a boxer. And uh, today he's taking this back, and his stock price has dropped maybe 10 or 20 percent in the last few days while he was contemplating this. Does it deter him? No, it doesn't. Press forward, and my gut feel is he will make it. He will do well. He will make it because uh, what Spring needs is an entrepreneur like him who has taken this kind of bet and made it, and he can bring the same talent, manage manager skill that he has, and entrepreneur skill to make Spring work now. Will be surprised Spring may one day overtake AT and T, or at least Spring will be a strong number two or number three, number three, and will be profitable. So he's like uh, almost, although he's not totally betting the house, but he's almost like like betting the house because he still got debt in his company, and he's taking on a uh, paying fifteen billion, and that company has got debts also. So if you add it all up, you think this is crazy. And the man is worth eight nine billion. Why is he doing all that? Maybe he must be. Thinking of Ted Roosevelt, so. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just maniacally driven, I guess. But that's great. Hey, you know what? We have already picked up some interesting insight from Tanshree. First, 
he's given us all a scoop, right, in journalism uh, parlance because he said that he just got the valuation for MOL, you know, which is 1 billion ringgit. I'm sure Ganesh may not have been too happy for that to share the room of 200 people and uh, how many people watching. <laughs> so that's great. And also the fact that uh, he's also given us a stock tip, right? I mean, if you want to invest now, you go and buy soft banks because their share price yeah. I've been watching is tanking. So, yeah, so I and, think. I think if you have extra cash, you go buy soft bank shares. I think you will do well, maybe you know, whole things. Maybe about five years time, maybe it will double, triple. Who knows? You know. But he's quite a guy. I mean, if you read about soft bank, what he has done, he's incredible. He's pretty young too. I think he's maybe now about fifty, early fifty. You know, he's pretty young. Well, pretty young because he's been around so long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, you got any more questions? Because we will wrap up in 10 minutes, okay? Uh, we've got uh, yeah. Hold on. Evelyn here. Uh, can you get the high, super duper high tech sensor mic? <laughs> Actually, this question actually has to do with your thinking on whether people will pay for education here for self directed learning. You talked about English and the weaknesses here in, in Malaysia, perhaps in Asia. We know things like Khan's Academy, Rehan School is quite popular in other places. But here people seem to like to go to classes. What if we put education on the web? Would, would Do you think it is viable that people would actually pay to learn for themselves? Okay. Okay, just a quick one then. Uh, a question I want to ask the audience before the three answers. Uh, think of an angel uh, experience you have had and if you're willing to share that, right? Share that and, and get Tanshree's take on, on what he thinks of that situation, yeah? That would be interesting if, some, if someone can share that. Okay. No, I think, uh, sure, I mean, uh, people will pay, but you know, problem in the net, people don't pay too much. There's so many free stuff on the net, so people will pay too much. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, if it's a compelling, uh, what you can convince people, of course, if uh, all the, uh, most of the students for this, uh, unfortunately, have a lower income. So actually what I have done is I've got this uh, young man here, uh, Raj, would you like to stand up? Raj Singh, his father is an incredible man. His father and both he and his brothers, uh, they actually set up three school, uh, schools to teach people English, and they call it SOS, uh, SOL 24-7. SOS stands for Science of Life 24-7. But their focus is on English. Now, I've always felt that, <clears throat> you know, a lot of us, most of us here, we are so fortunate that we have the benefit of an English uh, medium of uh, schooling, you know. And we, you know, you go up to Form 5, your English is pretty good. You can read and write, so you can learn a lot. You know, I always say, you know, in the internet, uh, if you don't know English, wow, it's a real big handicap. Can you imagine if Malaysia would try to translate all the information in the internet to Malay and then the, what the Malay have written to English? Maybe we need 500,000 translators. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe not so many. <laughs> 500,000 translators, when do you get them? So the reality is English is so important. So I'm trying to contribute because I thought I'm blessed in this. I would like to give back. So one of the things is uh, I found this organization. You know, they did an incredible uh, job of uh, teaching people English. And the father actually went to Cambodia because he thought Malaysia doesn't need it. And they did. They helped so many people in Cambodia. Then they went to Papua New Guinea. So they also have in Malaysia. I mean, the father could have been a wealthy man, but he just wanted to do this. So I truly admire the father. So my foundation, I got a foundation called Better Malaysia Foundation. Last year I chose his father as a personality of the year and I gave the father 500,000 ringgit as a cash award. You know what the father did with 500,000? He gave most of, it to, most of it away to his teachers and volunteers. <laughs> so what, what they did is they bring in, uh, for example, a lot of students, I went to they have a school here in Skambut. Uh, they have 100 students who stay there. And most of them, after Form 5 or SPM, they have people from Oral Asri, they have from Sabah, Sarawak, and no income people. They can't, they can't speak English. 
after six months, they all can speak very fluent English. They have got this program, it's like English immersion. And then they make it, uh, you'll know, be fine if you speak anything other than English. So they come in, they have to struggle with English, they must speak English. That's a fantastic program. So I say, you, this is the party that I'm looking towards to help me in uh, spreading English, to help more people in this country speak English. So I pledged to give them 10 million. Uh, so they have, uh, they didn't really spend that much, one, maybe a million now. I say, go and build more center. You know, then maybe we can, we can donate more money and then I can later get some other people to donate, you know. So we at least complement uh, what the government is trying to do now also. Of course, we all know that education policy is um, very sensitive to talk about it. But, uh, so, <clears throat> so that regarding what you say about English, I, 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 I'm sure the people will pay for it. But uh, unfortunately, those who need it uh, are the people in the Kampong, in the world. You know, in Klang Valley, most people that middle income and upper middle income will be able to send their children some to private school or at least give them tuition, English tuition. And then some even you send them to Chinese school or national school, Malay school, a Malay medium school. Parents speak English at home. So some children grow up thinking their mother tongue is actually English. A lot of us speak English with our children. You know? And for some of my children, they, they only speak uh, our dialect is Hokkien only with mother grandma. <laughs> with those who don't speak English. So, so what is you know, what I think people will pay, but not too much. And the problem is low income people. So maybe you come with a program like this, some people have to fund them. You know? And unfortunately, uh, it is so sad you know, that <clears throat> the future poor boys out there in the village that I was when I was young would not be able to have this opportunity of the benefit of a good English medium schooling. It's a bit unfortunate. And I always say it's very important, and I say it to every country I go. You know, I want to relate to you. I went to Vietnam and met the president of Vietnam in the early days when we were investing in Vietnam about four or five years ago. So the president was telling me, you know, we thank you for investing in, in Vietnam. We need a lot of jobs for people. We have too many people. So he said, we are going to hit almost 19 million, too many people. Do you know what I told him? I said, Mr. President, to me, people is an asset. I always, I tell him, you know, can you imagine like, China only has 100 million? I think we are not afraid of China. <laughs> can you imagine if China only has 100 million people? China will be so rich, you know? They have full employment long time ago already. They are 100 million people. But they have 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 So I see you have great asset. You know, 90 million, that's what we like your country. Think of the 90 million consumer down the road, as opposed to 28 million here. I say that, but Mr. President, one thing you must do, you should make your people here bilingual. They should learn English. They should learn of course, you want to teach them Vietnamese, that's a national language, everybody wants to do that. But you must make them bilingual, you must teach English side by side with uh, your Vietnamese. And can you imagine, if all your people are bilingual, you can speak English, you can speak Vietnamese, your country will be great. You don't have to worry about employment. The world is the employment, they can go anywhere, they can get employed. Look at the Filipinos, anywhere they'll be employed. You go on a boat cruise, and everybody is Filipino. <laughs> so no. So they don't have to worry. But if you are just you don't know that you know the Vietnamese will come and work here. What can they do? They just have to stay in the factory, do their thing. What else can they do? Because they don't know English. So how important English is. Yeah. So that's why in my you know, because I say I'm blessed and we should always give back to society after we're done well. I always believe in that long, long time ago. And so I said, what a way to contribute is this language, this English language. So that we 
If we make them all at least can speak, can you know, and uh, later read and write a bit better. They all can read and write, but speaking is a problem. So after we get it, a lot of them will become more employable. The hotel industry will prefer to hire Malaysians if they can. Why would you want to employ Filipinos? They prefer to employ Malaysians. But now a lot of Malaysians don't speak English properly. And you go to the resort, they don't speak English, they try to avoid the guests <laughs> because they are so shy. You know, and then the guests say, your hotel service is lousy. I see your guests, they are so shy, so afraid because they don't speak English. So we are trying to do that. We just started the English program in Tioman, in Redang. You know, it was so heartwarming. I was in Tioman this last weekend. My general manager was telling me, you know, there are many housewives learning English. So we also teach housewives learning English. They also come and learn. So they have housewives, then they have adults at night, then they have school children after class coming. And we set that up. You know, we sold the depot. And uh, Rush, Rush, Rush managed to get even volunteers from overseas, from Europe. We have, they got European. And Rush just told me, I had a meeting with us today on how to expedite our program. Rush was telling me, if they bring European, which is very strange, you know, they bring European to the school, to, to, the, to the center to teach, the enrollment goes up. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Rush, you must be good looking European. <laughs> no, it's just a perception issue here. I guess, is the mic with somebody who wants to share an angel story with that street? Uh, somebody hands up so the mic can be passed. Anyone? No, do you have a question? Just a question. Okay, so then you can use the mic. And I guess just before you ask the question, that's it. How important is gut feel for you when you are an investor? Because you hear that a lot so much, right? And oh, you just said something about. That was uh, my question. Oh, that was not my question. question. Okay. Oh. Okay, then I'll ask him to ask. You ask. Okay. okay. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate you because clearly your support for the entrepreneurs is more than just making money. It's, it's altruistic. It's helping people, and that's, that's a great thing. I suspect you're also having a lot of fun, too, so I guess we'll pack you later. Uh, Paul Graham of Y Combinator wrote a really good article the other week talking about how he's looked at so many investments and occasionally things come by him that don't make any sense at all, and a lot of the VC community talk about that, that some of the not obvious investments just pass them by because they feel strange, they don't stack up, and they let them go. But the community is starting to look more carefully at those things, thinking just because it doesn't feel right, let's not just turn our back on it. So I'm just wondering, in your experience, does that come past you where something comes across you and maybe intuitively you feel it's interesting, but maybe even the managers are saying, leave it alone? So how do you, how do you cope with that? Oh, one thing I learned over the years, don't listen to your finance manager. <laughs> But possibly, not all the time. <laughs> you know, for example, <laughs> I tell you, this is not an internet business. Uh, you know, I was negotiating to buy 7 Eleven here in the year 2000. So they were asking for 80 million. So they make about 300,000. So they have 140 shots. So my, my finance guy, how can we pay 80 million for? <laughs> 300,000. 1-8 or 8-0? 8-0. 8-0. 8-0 make 300,000 profit. You know? <laughs> make 300,000 profit. How can they pay 80 million? That's what he wants and there's no other guys waiting. There's another a guy waiting, a horrible waiting. You know? <laughs> Maybe the foreign, we don't buy for them and knock him down on the edge. But he wants 80 million. So my financial guy said, no way. It's too high. It's too many times PE and what PE. <laughs> so I said, mm, yeah, but how about we buy it and then we double the profit every year? Why? How can you double profit? I said, maybe if you are lucky, we will double the profit. So 300,000, 80 million is what? Profit times P, right? It's 200, uh, 300, 250 over time P. Right? So you double it. Then it's 125 double again, maybe. You know, so I say, well, maybe we can make it work. Uh, but I say, you know, we buy this for long term, we buy long term, we we'll build, build, the, the, build the business. And one of the things I say is, we want to buy, we we'll open a lot of shops and make it work. And we did that. So we paid 18 million. I paid 18 million. 
you know, then I uh, did one of those silly things, uh, you know, <laughs> go and list it for 600 million. And after seven months, I said, oh my god, I made a mistake. So I put it back and paid them 30% more. So I go, seven months, they all get 30%, oh, they're all very happy. But I was like an idiot, but never mind. <laughs> I decided that, no, I think I want to keep it. And if I keep it a few more years, build, say, a few thousand stocks, it should be worth a couple of billions. A couple of billions. And I think it's happening. Yeah. It's happening because you are the dominant one, you are the, you are the first mover, you are like Astro, no? You are the only one, you are the biggest, so you pay a lot for it. So on that basis, uh, this is what, if I listen to the financial guy, he won't buy, or he would tell me, no, uh, 80, no way, man, how about 50? 50, he tell you to take a walk. <laughs> <laughs> so, today your question, uh, so, gut feel is so important, it's also gut feel. Of course, it's not, you can't double the profit every year, but I'm just saying, it just, if I double, it just, but we'll try to make it work. But the gut feel is, I think we can make this work. You know, this is needed in all places, but they did, yeah, the previous owner was not aggressive. You know, open a lot of stores. We open a lot of stores, this company will be worth more. And it actually is true. So, yeah. I actually have a question for you then. So, um, we know that you've invested in quite a number of companies, but for every company that you invest in, how many uh, companies have you sidelined or five bucks? I mean, just to get an average on, you know, investment versus those that fail to get investment. Maybe about. Maybe out of the proposal, we see maybe we invest in about maybe 20, 30 percent. So maybe we see that we invest two or three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, I'm more optimistic, maybe. So I try more goal attempts. <laughs> the, the reason I think that that concern was, at, at the end of the day, to, to get the right investor, it's like the willing buy, willing sell thing. So for entrepreneur side, going to 10 investors may not be sufficient. So as an entrepreneur, you need to go to as many investors as possible. It may be 20, 30 investors before you hit the right person who is willing to bet on you. So that's that's the case. So don't give up when you worry about it. Then, and then say no, and say, oh, okay, there's really no investors here. You need to go up uh, as often as possible. And also, uh, I must add, you also need to be lucky, uh, because not only after they invest, they've got to continue. You've got to find an investor that will continue to want to hold your hand and take you all the way. So I think in Ganesh's case, uh, in the in the other investment that still stays with me and doing well, uh, I continue to hold their hands and on and off they come and say, you know, there's this thing, how about putting two, three million, should we invest this, should we do this, and study the thing. I say, what do you guys think? You guys say, oh no, I think we should invest. Okay, then let's do it. We'll put it down. So you've got to, for Ghana, you be able to build, I mean, realistically, two million build and one billion companies. It's possible, but tough. Right? But in this case, is I keep putting in money over the years until eventually my net investment is in, and now I almost have a net investment there of about 90 million. But very often I put myself at credit, put my credit on the line. I'm willing to go in some, you know, go and take a loan. I sign as the guarantor. If I sign guarantor, the bank will give the money because anything goes wrong, the bank asks me, you know, I have to pay up. So, so you must, if you have a investors who continue to hold your hand and want to in, continue to invest, then you have a better chance of building a big, bigger company. Because the initial investment may not be enough. You know, the initial investment, they may put 2 million, 5 million, and then after that, they run around and then what are you going to do? You close shop. So you can't close shop if you still want to save your original investment, you put in more money. But in uh, Ganesh case, it says that we want to expand. Uh, not that you know, they were already we want to expand and so we keep buying new things from uh, buying different companies, buy a company in Thailand, buy a company in Vietnam, buy a company in uh, India, in the uh, Philippines, you know, and now all over now going to Brazil, to Turkey, US. So 
I think in Brazil, you make sure Ganesh doesn't go during the Rio festival. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is not that of business. <laughs> okay, I guess we, we need to end this now. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, Doc Siva had question or monologue? Question. Question, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. Uh, Doc Siva is great. Hi, Dan Sri. Good to have you here. Sorry, uh, Doc Shiva is one of the leaders in the in the in the startup internet community in Malaysia. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kanan. Yeah. Uh, Tanzania is slightly different from angels and so on. I'm just a little bit more interested in, in your motivations. Uh, you came from a very poor family, so when you were young, what was it that motivated you? I mean, you went into business and so on. What motivated you when you were young? And now that you know you have more money than you can spend, you're already a multi-billionaire. You have so much money and you just retired. What motivates you today? When you wake up, what is it that you know you do when you wake up? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know when you're poor, it's easy to be motivated. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to ask, right? <laughs> so you know the answer. Uh, but I was blessed, you know, uh, in a way. Actually I was supposed to uh, to go to New Zealand and study. Then that year, my father failed in his business. He's a small contractor. He failed. Uh, <coughs> uh, but my father and mother still say, never mind. You go. We'll make. We'll somehow sort it out. I say, oh no no no. <laughs> I said, no way. I'm going while you are struggling. <coughs> so I went. I came out and worked. And you know, so that was great motivation. And then uh, nowadays, uh, well, you know, retirement is. Uh, I actually retired from the public listed company, but I'm still giving advice and helping. You know, like uh, Don Mateo always joke with me, the British advisor. And I'm like the British advisor. <laughs> So we told the management you have to take the British advisor advice. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> now I'm motivated. Uh, well, I still want to make money, uh, but I've uh, pledged to give uh, half my wealth away. I think uh, some of you have heard of it, and I'm trying to uh, do more charities work. Like this English thing is. Uh, it's charity that's like, for the community, you know, and it's for Malaysian. Uh, and of course, we, we hope to take it to other countries as we can, uh, as we grow. Actually, you shouldn't say charity. This English thing is empowerment. You know, it's not sure, charity. yeah, but it is of course with the aim to help the community. And and I pledge to to uh, Rush Father that I'll give ten million. You spend it, and then I will come up. You know, to spend it means you have to build a lot of centers. So they are. They are rushing to build centers, so we will, and hopefully, uh, a lot of uh, people who go to the national medium, you know, Malay medium, when they come out, they go to this place, then they get to speak English well, and then hopefully all of them will get better jobs. And that will also, we hope it will motivate them to then continue to study and improve their English. And I think that will be that will be good for all of us, right? because we need all these people to work one day. We want to hire people who can speak English. So that we can communicate with them, we tell go to the net and check this, check that. We don't know English how to check. <laughs> so, so by by uh, helping more people to speak and learn English well, we will indirectly all of us help ourselves in the long term, you know. And uh, so that's one of my big motivation. And of course, we try to help charities here and there. And uh, and uh, I said when I make the announcement, I said nowadays we are overwhelmed with requests. <laughs> so I don't know whether I did the right thing or not. <laughs> but uh, we'll try to manage and help whatever we can and what we think is deserving cause, deserving uh, individuals. Yeah. Great. It's great. I think we will uh, end, end here now. I think all of us here, we're, we're, I, I think we could be a part of history or so because I think it's the first time. That I know of, at least uh, 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 a billionaire, you know, that's not even just in Malaysia, maybe in Southeast Asia has, has done a Google Hangout thingy, you know. So, Vikesh, do you think so? Yes. So, really, all of you are part of history here. But thanks, thanks to all of you also for coming and for listening. And I guess 
Francis has given us a bit of a tip also. If you want to get some money from him, because he's a hockey guy, right? you go and call hockey guy the bottom boy. <laughs> <laughs> No, speak English. <laughs> okay, you pass. I'll just test it for you. Okay, English all the way. Okay, thanks. Now, so can you mingle for a while? Please come up and say hi to your plan or whatever, right? And then I got to come out at least ten minutes for SME lecture. Okay, good. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was. Uh, but English, unfortunately, English people that need it most don't have the money. You know, like I said, the, the low income people. It's so unfortunate. That's why we are trying to do this thing. You know. Yeah, I think yeah, rush. There's a fantastic family. The gates are doing a wonderful job. Yeah. In the tax base, all this application is so much for my.